Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Pictorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. Nineteen sixty nine, Major League Baseball expanded by four teams and split each league into two divisions. In the National League, the Montreal Expos, now known as the Washington Nationals, were added to the East Division and the San Diego Padres were added to the West. In the American League, two teams were added to the West Division, the Kansas City Royals and the team that is now known as the Milwaukee Brewers, the Seattle Pilots. Yes, before the Mariners came along, Seattle had a team, but it only lasted one season. And next, on Sports Forgotten Heroes, we're going to take a look back at the debacle that was the Seattle Pilots. This is Sports Forgotten Heroes. A tribute to the stars who shape the games we love to watch and the games we love to play. Stars who provided us with many thrills, but when their time was up, they faded away. We'll take a look back at their spectacular careers, their moments of fame, even if it was just for one season or just one game. And now, here's your host, Warren Rogan. Hello and welcome back to Sports Forgotten Heroes. As always, so glad you tuned in as we continue our journey in taking a look back at the stars and teams from the games we love to watch whom time has forgotten. And today, a team that so few remember and so few knew existed, the Seattle Pilots. You see, way back in the 1960s, baseball was looking to expand. The Dodgers and Giants had left New York for California, and shortly thereafter, the Angels were born. But for the American League, the Angels were, well, sort of out on the coast alone. In 1968, the A's joined them when they moved to Oakland. But baseball was looking for more, and it decided to not only expand, but to split each league into two divisions and create, for the first time ever, a playoff system. So, as I mentioned in the tease, the National League moved into San Diego and Montreal, a completely new territory. For the American League, it was necessary to place a team in Kansas City, and we'll get into the reasons why a little later. And the AL also wanted to expand into a previously untapped territory, and it decided on Seattle. Now, as exciting as it sounded to many, it was anything but Ownership wasn't solid. Many Seattleites did not want a Major League Baseball team. And there were several politicians who didn't want a ball club as well. But the AL was determined and sort of forced the issue. And in just a moment, Bill Mullins, who wrote the book, Becoming Big League, Seattle, the Pilots, and Stadium Politics, He'll be joining us as we explore what went right and a lot of what went wrong during the building of the Pilots franchise and its one-year existence. Before we get there, though, just a reminder that you can follow Sports Forgotten Heroes on Twitter at SportsFHeroes, look for our page on Facebook, or check out our website, SportsFH.com, which has a ton of information on all of our past episodes, including links to more about each person or team we remember, information about our guests, links to the books they have written in case you want to order a copy, notes about upcoming episodes, and links for you to email us, ask questions, or suggest Forgotten Heroes for future episodes. We'd love to hear from you. That's sportsfh.com. And as always, if you can, please leave us a five-star rating on whichever platform you're listening to us on. 
You know, one of the more surprising facts about the pilots I discovered when researching for this episode of Sports Forgotten Heroes was the fact that the pilots were not exclusively named pilots for the area's association with Boeing. In fact, the name pilots was more about piloting a ship. But the uniforms, well, they were certainly cool and they definitely had a connection to aviation. Another fact that surprised me was how opposed people were to bringing a Major League Baseball team to Seattle. There were those who just wanted to keep Seattle isolated from the rest of the U.S. Of course, that didn't work out. Bill Mullins, who was in Seattle during the pilot's brief existence, wrote the book, Becoming Big League, Seattle, the Pilots, and Stadium Politics, which explores so much about the Pilots and the city. As much as it talks about the team itself, it also really dives into all that happened around the team and how all of it led to the birth of the Milwaukee Brewers and paved the way for the Seattle Mariners and the Seattle Seahawks of the NFL. So let's get to today's guest, Bill Mullins, and start examining the, well, I guess, the debacle that was the Seattle Pilots. Bill, welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes. I'm thrilled that you were able to find some time to join us and talk about a team long forgotten, the Seattle Pilots. Thanks for being here. Well, Warren, uh, it's a privilege to, uh, to talk about the Pilots with you. I appreciate it. Well, I got to ask you, you wrote the book, Becoming Big League, Seattle, the Pilots, and Stadium Politics, back in 2013, 44 years after the Pilots were born. What prompted you to take on such a mammoth topic? And I mean mammoth because in reading your book, I had no idea of how huge the issues surrounding the pilots were? Well, definitely, as I, I did my research, it, it grew. Um, my, my original idea, I had just retired uh, from teaching, teaching history at Oklahoma Baptist University. We had moved back to the, the Northwest, and I needed a, a project uh, <laughs> to do um, to, to keep me busy. And I had actually begun graduate school at the University of Washington, um, in the fall of 1968, so I was here in the spring and the summer of 1969 when the pilots were here. And I mm-hmm. thought, well, it would be pretty interesting um, to do some research on the pilots. Uh, there were a couple of books uh, already out, mainly focusing on the um, the on-field activities. Sure, sure. And, and what I wanted to do was to take a look at the business side of, uh, of of the pilots, how they came to Seattle, uh, why they left, and and uh, and what happened uh, during the during the season. And as I did my my research, I decided, well, I needed to to write about Seattle as well. I wanted to try to capture um, the the sense, the spirit, the essence uh, of Seattle as it dealt with the pilots and kind of fumbled them away. So it's a, it's a baseball book. It's an urban history. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a kind of a business history. Uh, it ended up being several things. Mm-hmm. No doubt. And let's get this out in the open right now. There is no way possible that we could cover everything about the Seattle pilots in one sitting. So we'll jump around a little, have a good time doing so. And of course, though, you always have to start at the beginning. And the beginning for this team came in the early to uh, mid-1960s when around the time Seattle played host to the World's Fair. Talk about the success of the World's Fair and what role it played in Seattle wanting a major league franchise, or at least some people in Seattle wanting a major league franchise. Well, that's exactly it. There's, uh, I kind of identified three different interest groups uh, in Seattle. Um, one of the groups is just the politicians. Uh, another group I called the civic leaders, uh, who were the business people, really business men of, uh, of, of Seattle. And then the third group was the boosters. And the boosters were excited 
to to make Seattle a major league city for baseball mm-hmm. um, as early as 1960. The Dodgers and Giants had moved uh, moved to the West, and uh, they wanted Seattle to be a part of that as well. But it wasn't until the World's Fair in 1962 that the city of Seattle, I think, um, had enough self confidence to even seriously consider luring baseball um, to to the the Northwest. I think that that even though they they disliked um, the description, they kind of had to admit that it was true, and that is that Seattle was pretty much an outpost, an urban outpost in the far Northwest that people would come to occasionally, but wouldn't consider uh, to be a, a big city. But after the after the World's Fair. Um, Seattleites had some pride. They felt as though maybe they could do just about anything. And, and one of the next anythings was to try to bring a baseball team uh, to Seattle to make the, the city literally uh, a big league city. And so they, uh, they began to work on um, building stadium um, and talking with, uh, with Major League Baseball about uh, maybe moving a franchise mm-hmm. or – uh, or establishing uh, an expansion franchise for the city of Seattle. Mm-hmm. And the Pilots, actually, they weren't the first major league team to call Seattle home. I mean, w- wasn't it the Supersonics? Well, that's right. The first, the first, um, I guess, major league sports team was the Supersonics, uh, and they had, um, they had come um, uh, a couple of years earlier, and uh, but the the feeling, especially among the Seattle sports writers, is that NBA basketball in the middle 1960s, um, it was pretty nice, but it wasn't really major league. Mm-hmm. In order to be major league, you had to have a baseball team. Maybe by that time, uh, an NFL team would count as major league, but uh, still in the minds of uh, the the people who really beat the drum for the pilots. Um, it took a baseball team to to certify you as a as a true big league city. Mm-hmm. But before we go to baseball, I do have another question about the Sonics, the Supersonics. What kind of crowds did they attract, and and how widely accepted were the Supersonics? Uh, they were well accepted. Uh, the crowds were just about average for the NBA. Um, in in those years, um, it, it, they didn't pack out the arena, uh, but the uh, you know the numbers I think were around six thousand uh, per game, maybe a little bit more than that, um, and so it was satisfactory. Um, so the the Sonics, in a way, were a stocking horse uh, for the other major league franchises that finally made it uh, to Seattle: the Pilots first, and then the Mariners, uh, and of course the Seahawks. Mm-hmm. And so uh, the, the Sonics indicated that Seattle could support uh, a franchise with uh, with some work, uh, but again. It just wasn't quite the real thing. What about the minor league team, the Seattle Rainiers of the PCL? How were they accepted amongst the Seattleites, and how good a team were they? Seattle was a was a good minor league city. Um, after the the Second World War in the late 1940s, the early 1950s. Uh, Seattle actually led the PCL, the Pacific Coast League, uh, in in attendance. Um, as as time went on through the 1950s and into the 1960s, they still drew well, uh, but they were not the not the leading franchise uh, along the along the Pacific Coast anyway. But um, Seattleites enjoyed their baseball. Um, Seattle, truthfully. It's a football town. Mm. Uh, in those days, it was the Washington Huskies. Uh, they were the primary game uh, in town. But the baseball fans loyally supported uh, the Rainiers, and that, that gave an indication that Major League Baseball probably would be well-supported. I don't think it was a sure thing. Um, um, NFL football was most likely what Seattleites would would really turn out for, um, and and that turned out to be the case. That's one of the stories of the pilots staying for only one year, um, is that Seattleites did not flock 
mm-hmm. uh, to the pilots. Uh, attendance uh, through the year was 677,000. Um, I, I think um, the the owners, uh, Pacific Northwest Sports Incorporated, thought that probably they would be able to draw a million, and that's kind of what they figured their budget on, mm-hmm. and it, it fell short of that. Significantly short. Now, there were two teams that actually investigated moving to Seattle, the Cleveland Indians and the Kansas City Athletics, now known as the Oakland Athletics or the Oakland A's. First, talk about Gabe Paul and the Cleveland Indians and why they considered Seattle and then ultimately decided to stay in Cleveland. Well, um, the the Indians... Uh, we're trying to pressure the city of Cleveland to do some um, some refurbishment of um, of Memorial Stadium in in Cleveland. Um, it's not clear if they really were going to move to the West Coast, but um, they had some some genuine interest in the West Coast, and um, they visited Seattle. Um, they visited Oakland as a as a possibility for moving. And maybe had a little bit of an interest in the in the Dallas Fort Worth area uh, as well. But when they came to to Seattle in 1964, so this is after the World's Fair, mm-hmm. um, they took a look at um, at Six Stadium, which is the Rainier's minor league stadium, and didn't really think too much of it. Uh, it it probably had a capacity of around eleven thousand. Um, and it was owned by the the Rainier Brewing Company, so they would have had to negotiate uh, with the with the, the six family who owned the the brewing uh, company uh, to to make it larger. They took a look at some different places uh, where they might be able to build a stadium, um, and then they sat down with the the mayor and his aide and got a really strong impression that. The politicians, the mayor was really not interested at all in mm-hmm. doing any kind of business uh, with the, the the Cleveland Indians. Um, the mayor, Darn Brayman, said, "Well, you know, Seattle might be ready for a big league team in about five years." Hmm. Um, that's that's not the way to lure uh, a, a team uh, from from another another city. And so, Gabe Paul's conclusion was Seattle. What you need to do is to build a stadium if you're if you think you want to have major league baseball here. We're not going to come uh, because that stadium hasn't been been built yet. But one one kind of side piece to that is that the co-owner of uh, of the Indians was William Daly. Right. And William Daly was a, a kind of an entrepreneur financier uh, from Cleveland who um, had uh, taken part ownership in the Indians. And he was with, with, with Paul. He agreed that Seattle wasn't really ready for big league baseball, but Seattle must have made an impression with him uh, because he ended up being the primary, not the majority owner. There was no single majority owner, mm-hmm. but the primary owner uh, of the Seattle Pilots. And so he would show up again in 1968, 1969. Right. And before we get there, the Kansas City Athletics, who were mm-hmm. owned by the infamous Charles O. Finley. <laughs> um, now, that that move might have had, or potential move, might have had more legs to it. Um, didn't Finley's threat to move the A's to Seattle really help the proposed ownership group get the pilots? But by Finley leaving Kansas City and heading to Oakland, this actually opened the door. It it worked in favor of Seattle. Explain that. And I guess it okay. had to do with a, a guy named Stuart Symington and a potential lawsuit against baseball on behalf of Kansas City. That's exactly right. Uh, Charlie Finley, in a couple of different ways, plowed the ground uh, for the, the sowing of the, the pilots, for bringing uh, the pilots and expansion team um, to to Seattle. First of all, he visited Seattle in 1967. By that time, the city had purchased six stadium, and so the city actually had a stadium that it could use to negotiate with uh, when Finley came. Finley was pretty excited 
uh, about the possibility of moving west. I'm not sure that Seattle was number one. I think he had his eyes on Oakland, but he was willing to negotiate uh, with with Seattle. And what they kind of came to was that he would pay $165,000 worth of rent each year for five years uh, to be in six stadium and the city would spend about one point six million dollars refurbishing it, uh, expanding the the seating from that that eleven thousand to probably twenty five thousand or maybe twenty eight eight thousand and there is a real possibility of a deal um, until Charlie Finley uh, said that if Seattle failed to vote the bond issue for a larger stadium that he could be let out of the lease. And the city wasn't about to agree to that. Um, and, and Finley went off in, well, a Finley like rage, uh, (laughs) anyhow, (laughs) and, uh, and finally settled on Oakland. And kind of one of the interesting things is that at least a couple of sports writers wrote to the Seattle, um, writers, uh, congratulating them that they had missed out on Charlie Finley, that they didn't have to have to deal with him. Uh, but, but he did move the A's to, uh, to Oakland. And as you say, um, the, the Senator from Missouri, Stuart Symington, who was a pretty powerful, uh, fellow in the, in the Senate, uh, simply told the American League that if Finley leaves, you've got to give us another team, or I'll make sure you lose your antitrust exemption. And I think they were they they took Symington seriously that he could actually uh, make make that happen. And so the American League immediately um, ex- expanded. Uh, or, or created a couple of expansion teams. One of them was in Kansas City, mm-hmm. and the other was in Seattle. Um, but, but, so, but it wasn't necessarily going to be Seattle right off the bat. I mean, yeah, Kansas City, and I, and I wanted to stay in Kansas City for a moment. Wasn't the reason that Finley was going to leave Kansas City was because of the stadium issue there. He wanted a new stadium. They wouldn't give it to him. So he shopped around. He went to Seattle where you had six stadium and he ultimately wasn't happy with six stadium. He wanted a new stadium and Oakland's down there waving its hand going, Hey, come on over here. We got a stadium for you. That's right. The, the Oakland Alameda Coliseum had already been built uh, and so Finley was was able to move in um, right away, um, and so that's where he decided to go. And he was he thought he had a deal uh, with the Kansas City City Council for for a new uh, or at least improved park, but I think a new park. Um, and they reneged on it, and he was pretty upset. Um, and so just out of principle, uh, I think I think he was ready to leave. Kansas City. He wasn't going to deal with them. He wasn't going to negotiate with them anymore. He was going to go off uh, to greener pastures, and that turned out to be to be Oakland. Um, the, the The city council, I think, was much more willing to negotiate with whoever it was that um, that that the American League chose to head up. The, uh, the Kansas City, the new Kansas City franchise. Of course, that was Ewing Kaufman. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've, they've had, from what I can tell, a really good relationship. They had a good relationship all the time that Kaufman was the, the owner of what became the Kansas City Royals. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then the American League needed, needed a, a partner to make the, um, you know, it turned out the division, uh, to make the division all balanced out. And they immediately went to Seattle. I don't know that they considered any other oh, okay. uh, any other city. They were really excited about getting Seattle because you kind of look at a map, um, and there's this big vacant area in, in the northwest part of of the United States, um, and the population of of the Puget Sound area, uh, King County, which Seattle is the part of. Um, it it had a lot of people. Seattle was the 15th largest um, media um, center in the in the United States, and so I think the American League felt like it was getting a uh, a pretty good deal. 
Um, if you look at the blank area in the Northwest, especially in 1967, 68, 69, uh, part of it's blank because there's there's not that many people who live there, <laughs> uh, but but still Seattle seemed like uh, a potentially good good city, and the American League wanted to beat the National League uh, to to the Puget Sound, and so that's that's the reason that they paired Kansas City uh, with Seattle in um, in that wave of expansion, and Symington still had a part in this. Uh, he not only demanded that Kansas City get a team, and the American League was astute enough to uh, to give him one, but he said he wanted it as soon as possible. And yeah, that I meant mean, 1969. Kansas, yeah. yeah, I mean, the, 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 the A's left after the 67 season, I believe right. it was. So Kansas City was only without a team for one year. For just one year. And I I think that, that hurt. Seattle some uh, I'm not sh- well I'm I am sure um, the the city of Seattle and Pacific Northwest Sports Incorporated were not really quite ready to field a team in 1969 um, it would have helped them from a standpoint of preparation uh, to start the season in 1970 um, kind of getting ahead of the story uh, economically it would not have been um, a good year to start because the Boeing depression, and it was for Seattle, a depression, mm-hmm. uh, was, was, was starting, uh, in 1970. But as far as preparing to really feel the team and do it well, they could have used it another year. And that's why, so, so Kansas city wanted a team quickly. So yeah, they come in in 69 and you couldn't have an odd number of teams. So they had to pair another city with Kansas City and that's how they end up in Seattle is that why it was so important for the American League to expand to Seattle because they needed a sister franchise for Kansas City well that was one part of it they needed the balance uh, but the American League had really convinced itself that the next really good place for a baseball team to make money was Seattle not Dallas, Fort Worth, um, but mm-hmm. but Seattle. That would have been probably the main competition. Maybe San Diego, but they just had their eyes on Seattle. They really wanted it badly. Mm-hmm. By the way, at this point in time, the American League and National League, if I understand correctly, they basically operated as two separate entities. Sure, there was a commissioner of baseball, but each league had its own president. How was baseball operated at this point? And when did baseball bring both leagues together to operate as one? Well, you're exactly right. Um, uh, Through the book, the the, the person who is the executive decision maker for Major League Baseball is Joe Cronin. He's the president of the American League. Um, the, um, The baseball commissioner was William Eckert. And you're probably familiar with the, the the name that the press gave to William Eckert, the unknown soldier, right? Uh, which kind of gives you an idea of what power he had. Mm-hmm. Very little, mm-hmm. um, and and so um, it's it's Cronin that is really making the decisions about uh, where the American League is going to go, along with the the American League owners, of course. Um, and, and so they are operating separately, and they're they're really competing with one another. Uh, there's 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 a sense through all of the years of expansion, you know, beginning in 1962 and going beyond, is that they were supposed to tell each other what cities they were really interested in, and then kind of work out some kind of a deal of of, of sharing this territory or that territory, and they really didn't do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the American League moved in on Los Angeles as quickly as it could. Uh, the National League moved in on uh, on New York City uh, and on Houston, and there was there was not really a whole lot of cooperation in selecting the cities that were going to be uh, the expansion sites for either one of the leagues. It it really wasn't until well much much later. I would I would say at least in the seventies and Bowie Kuhn that Major League Baseball begins to kind of consolidate mm-hmm. uh, and, and make decisions together. Uh, probably if we could remember uh, when the umpire crews 
were you know rotated around and it didn't matter which league they were in right. uh that would be the the kind of finale of the consolidation that went on and that was only a couple of years ago what about ownership talk about Dewey Soriano and William Daly and how the ownership of the pilots was formed well the Soriano brothers uh Dewey and Max uh were the were from the northwest they had lived in Seattle most of their lives um, Dewey had played for the Rainiers. Um, when, when the pilots came into existence or when the expansion team was granted, Dewey Soriano was the president of the Pacific Coast League. And Max Soriano, his brother, uh, was the counsel, uh, for, uh, the Pacific Coast League. And mm-hmm. the report, the original report was that the Soriano brothers would be able to um, to raise enough money in the Northwest so that it would be thoroughly a Northwest operation. Well, as it turned out, they didn't have enough money. Um, they had to contact Daly, um, who was interested in having uh, having ownership of uh, of the Seattle franchise. And Daly ended up, as I said before, being the 47 percent owner of the franchise. He said he tried to recruit some Seattleites um, into into his organization, but he ended up giving 13 percent of the ownership to his friends in Cleveland. And so the pilots were owned, you know, by a 60 percent majority group uh, from Cleveland. The Sorianos, I think, owned about 33 uh, percent, and then other local people and one guy in Hawaii uh, <laughs> made up the rest of the, the ownership in, in small slices anyway. So William Daly uh, was the chief, again, not majority, but chief owner uh, of the Seattle Pilots. But in the Northwest, Dewey Soriano was clearly the face uh, of, of the Seattle Pilots, and he is the one um, who made most of the most of the decisions? You know, I, I, I guess I would call William Daly um, the CEO, the, the the corporate executive, and Dewey Soriano was sort of the chief operating officer. Mm-hmm. Now, when you take all of them together and you mix it all up, did they not have the right amount of funding to sustain ownership? Were they underfunded from the beginning? In a, in a way, I would say yes. Um, there's there's the sort of I would back up on that just a little bit. Uh, William Daly had enough money to continue to fund uh, the Seattle Pilots, and he uh, he agreed orally that he was good for eight million more dollars. Um, if the team needed it, mm-hmm. if the team was running a deficit, um, he, he would step up, uh, with 8 million and continue, um, to, to keep the, the club running, uh, and keep it running in Seattle. Um, that's what he said. He, he even signed a, a paper that, uh, that guaranteed a little bit less than that, but it was still a substantial amount of money. Um, and he reneged on it. Mm. So given what Daly was willing to provide, the the ownership actually was underfunded. All right. So the American League wants to go there. The Soriano brothers want a team there. There's there's I'm sure a a segment of the population that wants a team there, but not necessarily all of the big decision makers uh, who were elected to office, they might not necessarily have wanted a major league baseball team. Can you talk a little bit about how splintered uh, the local politicians were in wanting to bring the Seattle Pilots or wanting to make a team, wanting to create an expansion team? Yeah, that's really an important story. Um, again, it, it, it circulates around Six Stadium, the place that the, the pilots were going to play for at least their first four years, maybe their first five years that was possible. Um, the, the mayor of, of Seattle, Dorm Brayman, was, to say the least, not a baseball fan. He wasn't much interested uh, in, in bringing Major League Baseball to Seattle 
Um, but he was willing to talk uh, with, with Dewey Soriano, who was representing uh, the pilot's ownership. And so they began to talk about what kind of lease agreement, uh, it's called a concession agreement, uh, what kind of concession agreement the, the Pacific Northwest baseball was going to have uh, with the city to be able to use uh, six stadium. And what they, what they came to was five years for $165,000 that they would, uh, they would pay on the lease for five years, and they would pay that $165,000 every year. That's exactly what they negotiated with Charlie Finley. Mm-hmm. And the city would fix up the stadium, but it would spend $1,175,000. That's about a half a million less uh, than they, they promised Charlie Finley. And I kind of find that odd because Soriano, he's the local guy. Charlie Finley was from outside. They didn't give the local guy as good a deal as they were willing to give huh. Charlie Finley. Huh. And that, that really hurt Soriano. He was, he was pretty upset. Uh, and I think understandably so. Um, and then what turned out was that that 1.175 million to upgrade Six Stadium to 28,000 seats to put in major league level lighting uh, to to make a nicer press box uh, to provide concession stands uh, that were major league worthy. That was about 65 percent below what it would actually cost to do it. They put out the bids and they were well. Everybody right. was flabbergasted uh, that the bids came out. Um, and and that they would have to spend a good deal more money uh, to make Six Stadium um, a major league quality stadium, and that's what the the American League kept on saying was, you know, you've got to make this stadium major league quality. Right. You um, talk. So they a lot they had real that. troubles from the beginning. It was a colossal mess, I guess. Um, this was probably the biggest stumbling block in securing a team for Seattle. Tell us a little more about Six Stadium. I mean, it was a minor league ballpark. When was it built? And yeah, sure, it had less than adequate facilities to host Major League Baseball. Right. It was built in the late 1930s, um, and it was a really good minor league ballpark. Um, you know, even in 1969, it was it was wearing down at the edges, but still, for a minor league ballpark, it was a it was a nice venue. Um, but it wasn't supposed to be a minor league ballpark uh, anymore. Um, and the again, the seating was uh, that was one of the major problems. Like I said, there were probably eleven thousand seats in the ballpark uh, before the renovation began. Um, nobody really seemed to know exactly how much it is, but eleven thousand is what I saw more often than anything else. Mm-hmm. And it was because of the, the the cost of refurbishing was well beyond what the budget was. Uh, things went on really poorly. They, they didn't make an agreement to do the refurbishing until September. And so they had from September um, through the 1st of April to make it into a Major League Baseball park. Well, everybody knows it rains a lot in the winter <laughs> in Seattle. <laughs> and, and that was a problem. And this, that winter, 68-69, uh, was one of the coldest winters Seattle ever ever had. Of course. Uh, it Why didn't get it above. Be? Yeah. It didn't get above freezing uh, for, for 11 straight days, and that's really, really unusual uh, for Seattle. And so... Uh, the the process of, of of bringing in the new dirt of of installing the new bleachers uh, and the new seating went along really pretty slowly. Um, there was an argument over whether the the um, the dirt was the proper kind of dirt, and so they hauled dirt in and then they hauled some dirt out and then they hauled some more dirt in, uh, and it was taking taking forever. And didn't, and didn't opening, the truck drivers, the haulers, didn't they go on strike or something? They did go on strike. And they had to get a um, an injunction from the judge uh, to get them back to work so that the stadium could be could be fixed up for the season. Um, <laughs> by by opening day, they probably had about nineteen thousand five hundred seats. If you want to call um, them seats, yeah. Uh, many of the seats were just boards 
that were tacked on to the, the superstructure of the bleachers. Uh, I sat out there once. It wasn't really comfortable. I mean, it was baseball, but it, well, it wasn't very major league uh, baseball. Um, and then there were all kinds of problems during the season. Mm-hmm. Uh, those, those boards warped. Yeah. Uh, before the the season was was half over, uh, the older s- stands began to deteriorate. Um, there was problem with the lighting, uh, the lights along the third baseline. Somebody had to climb the pole for every night game and activate the lights at the wow. at the top of the pole. Wow! Um, I can only imagine. <laughs> and let me ask you the, this. Let me ask you this, Bill. How did city officials? convince the residents who were against bringing Major League Baseball to Seattle? How do they convince the residents to to vote to refurbish Six Stadium and bring Major League Baseball to Seattle? What, well, the, what were the, the convincing the six, arguments? Yeah, the Six Stadium money actually just came from the city coffers. Uh, there didn't have to be a bond vote for that. Uh, for the stadium that was supposed to replace Six Stadium, that ultimately was the Kingdom, they did have to convince them um, to to vote for that. It was a forty million dollar uh, bond issue uh, that that had to be voted on. And the American League said, "We won't give you the team unless Seattle votes for a a genuine uh, stadium." Mm-hmm. And the the Kingdom was a part of a a group of um, bond issues that 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 were presented to the people all in one election um, with kind of the vision of making Seattle um, into a a really major city um, and preparing for the influx of people that were coming into Seattle and the the two pieces that were the most important was the was the stadium the king dome uh, or the king county multi um multi use stadium um and rapid transit mm-hmm. and people did vote for the stadium i think they voted for it in part uh because it assured that the major league team that seattle had been given was actually going to come because if they voted against it the american league would have would have put that expansion team somewhere else mm-hmm. um and um and i and i think they voted for it uh, just on the on the basis of um it was a good thing for the city uh that the city was was beginning to look forward um in its in its planning uh and that it was it was growing big maybe even a leftover of that that seattle spirit that the uh that the world's fair had, mm-hmm. had generated six years earlier and so and the idea that it was going to be a multi-use stadium, and so yeah, there were going yeah. to be be all kinds of different things. There were supposedly conventions, not very likely, but there would be car shows, there would be rodeos, uh, there would be you know Billy Graham crusades, uh, and and all sort of things. Uh, uh, there would be soccer, um, there would be concerts, uh, rock concerts. Uh, in this in this big stadium, there would probably be a football team. Well, that's what I uh, wanted to ask you. There would probably be a football team, and you talked about it earlier. How Seattle is really a football town, and the NFL also had eyes on Seattle. Now, why did the NFL during all of this sit idly by, waiting for a stadium to to be built? and place a team there. Why didn't the NFL push for a team sooner and get a stadium built? Well, the NFL was pushing uh, for a stadium as early as 1966. The NFL said that Seattle would definitely get a team if there was a stadium. And there was a vote on the stadium in 1966, and the vote was not quite enough. And in the state of Washington, you have to have a 60% majority to pass a bond issue. And the stadium in 1966 got a 51.5 majority. And so the NFL said, boy, we love Seattle, but we're not coming until you build a stadium. Mm-hmm. And that promise was still there in 1968. So it was baseball, football, multi-use, and that was enough to put it over the top. Mm-hmm. Hey, one of the interesting themes in your book 
was the fact that Six Stadium was still far from being ready, as we just talked about, mm -hmm. as the pilots entered their first spring training. And there were threats that Seattle still might not get its team if the stadium wasn't ready. So first, what would baseball have done if they went up there, inspected the stadium and said, man, we can't play here. Was there a second city it could have gone to if it deemed six wasn't suitable enough to start the season? What would they have done? I, yeah, I really, I, I doubt that there was an, another place to go. What the, the American League kind of had an out. Uh, they demanded that Six Stadium be of major league quality, but they never defined what major league quality was supposed to be. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, uh, Joe Cronin sent uh, sent his friend, I think former umpire Charlie Barry, to Seattle several times to look at the stadium, and Barry said, "I don't like it. It's not good enough." Um, but but this is this is internal to the American League, so there were no headlines of. You know, six stadium deemed unacceptable. Uh, that that never happened. But there was always pressure on the city to make it better. Um, one of the one of the stories of, about six stadium is about the water pressure. Yeah, I have when, that written down here. <laughs> all right, when they when they had about an average attendance um, at six stadium uh, with all of the toilets flushing and everything going on by about the seventh inning. There was no water pressure <laughs> in the stadium, and there was there was one game um, when the the pilots were playing against the Yankees, and Joe Pepitone uh, was playing first base, and he left the he left um, left early. They substituted for him. He went in to take a uh, you know a shower, and the water pressure was not there. And according to the newspapers, he came running out, I assume, with a towel around him, but he was all <laughs> all sudged up and yelling in the in the restaurant what happened to the hot water. <laughs> it wasn't just and, the water pressure too, right? It was the restroom yep, facilities, yep. warped seats, seats without back. It turned out and, that the that the water paint. main that went into the stadium just wasn't large enough to accommodate uh the crowds that the the, the pilots had, and it wasn't until after the season that they they finally replaced the water main. So that was a problem anytime again anytime uh there was a little average or above average attendance the water pressure in the stadium just wasn't adequate. And and didn't at one point people complain about wet paint that their clothes were getting That's ruined? right. And they you brought know, they, a lawsuit and those, won. They had those 19,000 seats for um the first home stand. They didn't finally get 25,000 seats, which was kind of the agreed upon number that they, um, that they said would be okay, even though they, they were supposed to have 28,000. They settled for 25,000, and they hadn't put those in until the third homestand. And that's when some people sat down in the seats and turned around and realized that their clothing had blue paint on it. <laughs> <laughs> and because they were still still painting by the third homestand, they're still painting uh, the seats. Um, they worked it out. The company that built the seats finally agreed to reimburse the um, the, the 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 people uh, for their for their clothing. Uh, but that was an embarrassment. Yeah, it's crazy to think how deep we are into our conversation. We've basically only have spoken about the stadium and some of the politics, but there's many other things that go into building a franchise that listeners to Sports Forgotten Heroes might not even realize. So I'll bring up a topic, and you tell us about it, how difficult it was or how easy it was to secure or how convoluted it became over what entity actually had the right to sell those services. And let's start with season tickets. The further away from Seattle the fans were, the better the market. Is that true? That's true. Because people would take their vacations and come to Seattle because there was a new new major league club in town. Uh, and so people would travel a ways and it seemed like the farther away they came, the more likely they were to attend a game or several games because it was a novelty. It was something to do when you're on vacation. The people, the people who lived in Seattle, I really got a sense 
a lot of folks came out to one game and then it never came back. Hmm. Hmm. And there's a variety of reasons, but the biggest reason was the cost of the tickets. I was, that's the, on my list, too. Ticket prices. <laughs> that is the, amazing. The, the ticket scale ranged from $6 for the very best ticket down to uh, $2.50 for the cheapest ticket. Well, um, only the San Francisco Giants charged $6 for their top tickets, and that was just a few. Um, the Yankees charged 75 cents for their bleacher. And we're tickets. talking about 1969 folks. We're not talking about today. So <laughs> yes, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, they had the most expensive ticket in the game. They did. And Dewey Soriano thought Seattleites would pay a premium to see major league baseball. And I think Seattleites had trouble distinguishing what the pilots were doing from what the Rainiers had been doing mm-hmm. for several years. Mm-hmm. Uh, a couple of things were happening. There were some name name players like Don Mincher and Tommy Davis and, and Tommy Harper uh, and Steve Barber who who played for the Pilots, but there was also the the Wayne Comers and the mm-hmm. John Gellners mm-hmm. um, that, that that played. And the, the general manager, Marvin Milks, um, not a good general manager for an expansion team. He did not tolerate losing. Mm-hmm. And boy, if you don't tolerate losing in an expansion team, you you've got some problems. Yeah, you uh, do. And he would and he he churned the roster like crazy. Uh recently this this isn't such an odd statistic, but in 1969, having 53 players on your roster during the year tied a record for the most players. Wow. On a major league roster. Wow. And so people in Seattle must have felt like it's like a minor league team. You know, there are call-ups and there are send-downs. Well, for us, there's, there's players that we kind of liked who are missing the next time we go, so I'm not going to go again mm-hmm. and pay top dollar for people that I'm just beginning to know that seem to disappear. Mm, interesting. All right, what about the concessions? Well, the concessions were pretty pricey as well. Um, Maybe not as much as the as the as the tickets to the game, uh, but you you still had to pay more than many places, and certainly, well, almost twice as much. Um, you had to pay for a, a you know a hot dog was almost twice as much as it was in Tacoma, uh, where there was a minor league team. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and, you know, and maybe the choice between of... watching a decent minor league team and not paying so much, or coming up to Seattle. And watching a well, an expansion team that finished well under five hundred. Um, yeah, and didn't they sign I, I think some it's a, crazy a testimony that that Tacoma Tacoma survived quite well as a minor league team in what should have been the Pilots' uh, area of uh, of attraction. Sure, sure. And wasn't there some sort of contract that they signed with a concession company for an incredible number of years? Yes, they did. Uh, Sports Service was the company, and they got a pretty good deal. They um, they were the, the 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 team or the 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 company that would follow the pilots wherever they went, uh, especially into the newly built Kingdome. Um, that that may not have been been legal, but they had signed a contract they, that they could follow the team, and in return. Sports Service loaned um, the ownership of Pacific Northwest Sports $2 million at a pretty generous interest rate. Hmm. Hmm. Television. Television was nil. (laughs) Um, The radio contract was really good. It was for $850,000 with Golden West Broadcasting, which is Gene Autry's uh, company. Um, That was a boon. Uh, to the to the pilots, that was one of the best things that they did, um, and they tried to negotiate a television uh, contract with a um, an independent television uh, company, um, you know, Channel Eleven, not a network company. And Dewey Soriano said, "You know, I'll I'll be back with you. Uh, I'll I'll raise some of the ads. I'll I'll contact some people, and we'll have enough money so that we can make a contract." Uh, he never got back with the company. The <laughs> pilots were televised once during the entire season. NBC came to uh, came to Seattle 
uh, with their game of the week, and they televised the, uh, the, the pilot's game against the Detroit Tigers um, just before Memorial Day. Wow. And that was the only, only time they were on TV. That happens to be one of the games I went to. <laughs> it was a no-hitter into the ninth inning uh, when Joe Sparma gave up a double to Don Mincher. Wow. Wow. <laughs> one televised game the entire year. Here's yeah. something that I think Seattle did right. The ushers, didn't they employ some sort of Disney-esque philosophy on how to treat your customers? Well, they yeah, they did. The, the ushers were well-trained. They used the Disney, the Disney handbook. Uh, and so um, I... I I guess all of the all of the people who came to the game were properly uh, treated as guests uh, of of the pilot. So the um, the ushers were well trained. One of the problems is toward the end of the season, and when there are financial problems, a number of the ushers were laid off. So there yeah. just weren't as many ushers around mm-hmm. in August and September as there probably should have been. Mm-hmm. All right, let's change pace here and talk about the product on the field, beginning with the expansion draft. Can you tell us how it worked and whether or not it was fair? And, and when I say whether or not it was fair, would baseball let an expansion draft happen today the way it happened back then? Well, I, I think so, yeah. The expansion draft was actually the way that the pilots paid to get into the American League. Um, they, they paid $175,000 for each player that they selected from the other teams. And so they, they, you know, they ended up um, paying 500 and some, um, five, 5 million and some hundred thousand dollars mm-hmm. uh, to enter the American League. The reason they did that has to do with taxes and capital gains. If you sell a, sell a player to somebody, then you can claim it as capital gains rather than just um, a, a straight um, income. Um, and and the, the rosters of each of the established teams, uh, 15 players were protected off of the 40-man roster. And it was strictly American League, right? Was it the yes, pilots yeah. and Royals could only draft American League players That's while the right. Padres and the Expos could only draft National League players? That's right, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so every time the, 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 uh, the Royals or the pilots selected somebody, um, the, uh, the American League team was able to protect uh-huh, I'm trying to remember. Maybe they would one, pull maybe back three. three. I thought they three other back people three, anyway. Yeah. But they could they could protect several of their players. And and finally, um, the the pilots had to select um, what is it five? I think five players from each team. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right, and and they the first team to draft whether it was the pilots or the Royals. So let's say the Royals drafted first, and the pilots would get the second and third pick, then the Royals would get the fourth and fifth pick. So I think the pilots elected to draft second so they could get two picks in a row. That's exactly right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They won the coin flip and they decided to draft second and third. Um, And their strategy was kind of interesting. They said that they were going to, going to draft for the future. They were going to really look at, at maybe better players who are prospects rather than established players. But before the draft commenced, I'm pretty sure it was Dewey Soriano's uh, decision. They decided that they were going to draft name players. And I think what was happening is that with those higher ticket prices, season tickets were not selling well (laughs) at all. And Soriano decided, I better get some names in here in order to attract people um, to the the ballpark. Mm -hmm. One of the names was Joe Schultz. Why yes. was he named the manager of the Pilots? Who was Joel Schultz? Joel Schultz was the the third base coach for the um, uh, the St. Louis Cardinals, uh, and the Cardinals, you know, were doing well in those uh, in those days. Um, and I think they figured selecting Schultz would be, you know, somebody taking somebody from a winning team, uh, a perpetually winning team and bringing him to Seattle, 
I think he was a pretty good choice for an expansion team. He was a player's uh, he was a baseball manager, man. right? He was a player's What's manager. That? He was a player's manager. He was a player's manager, and he was, he was baseball all the way. He was not particularly articulate, um, but he was a baseball man's baseball man. Um, and I think that that was a good person to have in the clubhouse. Uh, Jim Bowden in Ball Four, which he wrote while he was with the with the Pilots, mm-hmm. um, kind of makes fun of him, and I think he's he's probably you can make fun of him. He probably did say, "Let's go and pound down some bud," um, and and all of that. But he seemed like a really genial person, um, and and as you say, a players' manager, somebody who wouldn't get on your case unless you were doing something you really ought not to be doing, unless you were loafing. Otherwise, he would build them up. Uh, he, was, he was a good man for, for expansion franchise, and the players loved him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What about the uniforms? I mean, I looked them up. I thought they were pretty cool, especially the hats with the pilot epaulets on them. Talk about uh, uh, the uniforms. Right. Well, the hat especially – um, it, it looks sort of like a pilot's hat. And again, the, the name pilots, um, it's a nautical reference mainly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Dewey Soriano was actually a Harbor yeah. pilot. Um, but it, it's, it's a good name for Seattle because it could also imply, um, that it's airline pilots as well. And so the hat looked like, um, a, a ship commander, but it also looked like the kind of kind of hat uh, that an airline pilot right. uh, would would wear. And so it, it had a gold band um, ar- around the rim um, at the front of it. And mainly on the bill, uh, it had the scrambled eggs uh, of a, uh, a commander mm-hmm. yep. uh, so that it looked like a, um, a ship's pilot. The, the sleeves and the socks were, were, had four gold bands. And so that's, that's a captain's uh, insignia as well. Um, the, uh, the uniforms were, were white with gold and blue decoration. So again, that nautical theme mm-hmm. was really, really strong. Uh, the, the logo was a ship's, uh, steering wheel rudder, um, with a baseball inside of it. And then attached to the wheel were two golden wings so that we would get the idea that it's nautical pilots as well as airplane pilots. Interesting. I mean, that's a really clever design. Yes. Hey, on the field, the pilots struggled through spring training. Pitching was, as expected, abysmal. (laughs) But they were able to hit. But I think the biggest surprise was a young guy trying to make it, Lou Pinella. Amazingly, they traded him to their fellow expansion team, the Kansas City Royals. Why? In fact, he went on to win the Rookie of the Year. I, 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 I don't get it. Well, the the story revolves around the general manager Marvin Milks. Um, to a degree, Schultz was not not real happy with Pinella. Pinella apparently during spring training had a sore arm, uh, and so he never let loose with a throw. Um, Lou Pinella, you know, is Lou Pinella. Um, he, he's a man with an attitude. Uh, he's a man who is pretty sure of himself. And I think that that attitude showed through even, even as a rookie, but there was a meeting the, the, the night that spring training ended, all the coaches got together with, uh, with the general manager milks and, uh, the manager, Joe Schultz, and they talked, at length about Lou Pinella, um, pretty heated conversation. And before they were done, they said, okay, Lou Pinella is going to be a part of this team. By the time everybody woke up the next morning, Lou Pinella had been traded to Kansas city. <laughs> Milks, Milks had traded Pinella. Uh, Milks was, was crazy for wanting to trade people, um, move people in and out. Um, and he traded Pinella, and the word was he almost milks almost got fired by Dewey Soriano hmm. uh, when he did that. But he let it ride, and sure enough, Pinella did win the Rookie of the Year with Kansas City. Now you talked about Tommy Harper and Tommy Davis and Jim Bouton. You also had Mike Hegan, 
Diego Segui, they actually got off to a good start, didn't they? I mean, heck, they even won their first game. They were competitive. <laughs> and and they were challenging for third place in the newly formed American League West through May. How competitive were they, and why couldn't they keep it up? Well, they were reasonably competitive. Uh, you're right. They won the first game. Uh, so they were 500 after two games. Um, and um, Joe Schultz, just kind of off the top of his head one day, told the press, you know, I think these guys are good enough. They could, We could even finish in third place. Oh, and that was like an albatross hanging around Joe Schultz's neck as far as Marvin Milks was concerned. Uh, as far as Milks was concerned, that was a promise rather than just some dreaming that Schultz was doing. But but they were in third place as late as the end of July or maybe the first day of August. Part of the reason is the rest of the of the division was not particularly good. They didn't play really well. They played consistently under 500 and fell further and further back from 500, but they were still in third place until well, the dog days started and then the age of the players, the fact that they had, you know, they had uh, experienced pulled pulled muscles before, um, they just they just wore down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They had a decent September, but August was awful. They had to play Detroit and they had to play Baltimore, and those were two of the best teams in the league. Baltimore went to the World Series, um, and they just couldn't keep up the competition. Um, they, they had something like a nine or 10 game game losing streak and that just killed it. They finally finished last in the American league West. Um, but they hung in there Mm -hmm. for a long time for like two thirds of the season. Mm -hmm. What about attendance? I mean, we talked that uh, we talked earlier that, um, overall they did not reach the numbers that they had wanted to reach, but when the team played well and, maybe was contending for fourth place or fifth place. Did they, did the crowds grow at all? They really didn't know. Um, the best, the best day, the best attendance day, uh, came in, I think it was early August, maybe it was late July. Um, it was bad day Mm -hmm. and people came out like crazy for bad day. They, they had, uh, capacity attendance. I think it was, it was over 23,000 uh, people came out for that. But really, the the attendance was not not really very good any time, even when there was some hope. You know, they had a five-game winning streak in in May, but that didn't particularly boost, boost attendance. It was fairly consistent, and the consistency was that 677,000. They did outdraw five other teams. Amazing. And um, mainly teams in the West, and um, there were four or five other teams that their their income because they were charging so much for tickets, um, you know their their income was greater than than several other teams as well. So um, the Seattle Pilots were not attendance wise or money making wise the worst team in the in the league or in, in Major League Baseball by any stretch. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But um, William Daly was just not happy with the way that it was going. Um, he wasn't willing uh, to give any any money, less much less eight million dollars, to keep the team in town. By the end of the season, he was ready to sell. Now, now he was ready to sell, and I've got to ask: Is part of the reason that he was ready to sell? Did that have anything to do with the fact that the stadium was still a huge issue? How difficult was the fight to get six stadium renovated? And what about the building of the new stadium? What happened there? Why was that yeah, project halted? There, there were problems with the stadium, both the old and the new, uh, the new stadium. Um, the Soriano especially continued to press the city to to fix up the stadium. I mean the water problem that's crazy. Um and and he asked and the 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 seats warping uh things that just weren't finished um when the city said that they were finished. Um Soriano refused to pay the rent one month 
And um, the mayor said, you know, you don't pay the rent. Uh, we're going to make your contract day to day. So, so you may, you may not have a stadium at all if you don't come through, um, well, with the, with a surety bond, uh, so <laughs> that we know that League there will be baseball, rent available. Right? <laughs> What's that? We're talking about Major League Baseball, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was an embarrassment. Um, and so the old stadium was a problem. The new stadium, there had been, uh, they, they, had, they had voted the, um, the $40 million to build the new stadium, and it looked like things were going to go along okay until they began to decide where the stadium was going to be. Um, their, uh, their consultants said it should be in South Seattle, the business people of Seattle said, no, it should be at Seattle Center. <laughs> and the decision of the, uh, of the group that was convened to make the decision on the siting of the stadium said, yeah, I think you're right. We'll do it at Seattle Center. A petition was circulated. It got a ton of signatures, and there was a vote on whether it was going to be at Seattle Center or not, and they voted against it. That vote came after the pilots had moved to Milwaukee. <laughs> so finding a stadium in Seattle proved to be virtually an impossibility for the pilot. So that, that would definitely um, make Daly upset. Um, he didn't get very good press. There was a, a pretty prickly beat writer named Hy Zimmerman mm-hmm. uh, who wrote a column uh, titled, Won't You Go Home, Bill Daly? <laughs> <laughs> and I think I, that may have been the straw that caused Daly to decide he was going to look for somebody to sell the team to. Yeah, he was ready to throw the towel in. And the team, I mean, like you yep. said, the team didn't do well. That like, I guess sort of expected they finished last in the AL West. They went 64-98. and Yeah, And that was also the end for Joe Schultz. Talk about that first season. And, and why did they let Schultz go? Well, again, it goes back to Marvin Milks. Marvin Milks just wasn't sure about Joe Schultz. Marvin Milks wanted a team that could win more games. And it didn't finish third place, which, again, Marvin Milks had somehow taken as a promise um, rather than a a kind of a pleasant fantasy before the season began. Um, And so after after the season had come to an end, Marvin Milks didn't say anything. Um, they said that poor Joe Schultz was was wandering around the World Series like a lost man, <laughs> not knowing whether he was going to have a job or not. And then finally, um, sometime in October, um, Marvin Milks fired him. And they brought in and a he hired Dave op- Bristol, who was not a players manager. Yeah, complete Dave, opposite. Dave Bristol was a pretty, you know, pretty hard guy. Yeah, complete opposite of uh, yeah. Joe Schultz. So ownership is frustrated. Daly had enough. It became pretty obvious that he was at his wit's end. He was ready to throw the towel in and sell the team. And this is where Bud Selig finally enters the picture. That's right. I mean, a real successful businessman, a guy who eventually becomes the commissioner of baseball, he wanted a team in his hometown of Milwaukee. I guess he never recovered after the Braves moved from Milwaukee to Atlanta. So That's exactly it. How was he brought into the picture? And I got to ask, why didn't the American League approach Selig instead of his Seattle counterparts to begin with? And one more thing, where does Lamar Hunt fit into all of this? Okay. Well, first of all, Selig is kind of a permanent fixture. Um, Selig was around to buy any team if it was available. Uh, and probably the Chicago White Sox were the most likely team that he would buy. But it, to, to, to use a kind of a cliche, um, he was holding the basket waiting for the fruit to drop, mm-hmm. and he didn't really care where it dropped from. And it turned out it dropped from Seattle. It wasn't the American League um, that that put Seelig up to this. It was William Daly who contacted Seelig, and the, the American League just stood by. Um, they made a deal during the World Series, um, actually in the bird feed room at, at, at Baltimore's uh, Municipal Stadium. Um, and by, I think, the second game of the World Series, the Seattle Pilots had been sold to Bud Selig. 
and then they had to decide what was going to going to happen. Just just to kind of detour to Lamar Hunt. Lamar Hunt was interested in a team for Dallas Fort Worth, and he probably did some negotiation as early as maybe September uh, with either the Sorianos or with William Daly. But that that didn't seem to to go forward at all. Uh, but selling the team to Bud C League went forward. But then the American League said, "We can't do this." <laughs> and it wasn't easy, and, was it? Yeah, and gave a chance to Seattle to come up with an ownership group, and they did come up with an ownership group. The first one didn't work out. The Bank of California, um, which had um, I had given a major loan to Pacific Northwest uh, Sports Incorporated, um, called in that loan. And so the first ownership group made up of Seattleites failed. They, they just weren't going to do it. The second ownership that was led by the fellow who became ultimately became the CEO of um, United Airlines Holdings. Um, he, was, he was actually a hotel man for Weston Hotels. Um, he was given a try at it. He came up with the idea of a nonprofit group to own um, to own the pilots. Um, it was a way to get a whole variety of Seattleites. Um, you know what he told them was, I don't care if you like baseball or not. You need to do your civic duty, and so if you buy this team and keep it here, you will have done your civic duty, and 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 we'll be good. And he was able to get enough people. To support him, he was able to talk the Bank of California into renewing the loan rather than revoking the loan, and he was just barely well enough funded to keep the team in Seattle. The American League owners didn't like the sound of nonprofit. I'm Charlie sure. Finley and Bob Short, especially, I don't think they quite understood what 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 was being said, but what they thought was being said is, I'll never make a profit on my team ever again, and mm. we're not going to have that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and so what the American League did was to vote against the second ownership foray, um, give $650,000 to the Sorianos and to Daly um, to run the team in Seattle, which was an impossibility. And 650000 wasn't enough. Not, not near enough. And the crazy thing is, Selig buys the pilots. All of this happens. He's going to move the team to Milwaukee, but it doesn't happen. All of this ownership changing hands, and the pilots are still in Seattle. And in fact, they go to spring training in 1970. They were still the Seattle pilots. And this is after Selig agrees to buy the team and move them to Milwaukee during the 69 World Series back in October. Towards the end of spring training, teams have to pack up their gear and (laughs) head home with it. However, no one knew where the pilots were going. I guess they sort of thought they were going to go back to Seattle, but then there were some that said, no, we're not going to Seattle. We're going to Milwaukee. So the gear gets packed up. And from what I heard, it was put on a truck that stopped someplace in Utah, like Provo or something. Supposed to be stopped around Salt Lake. Now, that's the legend. Yeah. And I talked to a guy who should have known whether that was true. I don't think it's true, but, you know, like the – the, the movie says, uh, "When the truth, when the legend becomes truth, print the legend." Well, it's a I cool think, story. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's the a great tr- story. Yeah, it stops halfway <laughs> between Seattle and Milwaukee until somehow instructions reach the truck driver, and he's told, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, bring the truck to Milwaukee." Yep, so, turn right. Yep. So that's when it was determined that the yep. pilots were going to be no more. And baseball was headed back to Milwaukee in the form of the Brewers. Yep. What happened, and how did this affect the players? Well, it affected some of the players quite a lot. What what had happened is that the um, the, the Pacific Northwest Sports Incorporated uh, declared bankruptcy, and they had to go through a bankruptcy hearing. And the bankruptcy said, "Yeah, there's no possibility that you can make money 
Um, I will declare you bankrupt, and the only solution to the bankruptcy is the sale to um, to Milwaukee. And so that was the remedy for the bankruptcy, and that is what then consummated the sale that there was a handshake on several months earlier in October, uh, anyhow. Um, at least one of the players had bought a, a house in Seattle oh, because my. he had asked one of the coaches who was from Seattle, you know, what's going to happen to the club? And the coach said, don't worry about it. We're going <laughs> to stay in Seattle. And so I think it was Mike Hagan oh, uh, who bought a, a house in Seattle, and that didn't work out so well because um, he ended up playing baseball in Milwaukee um, in 191970. The players themselves took the field in Milwaukee in their Seattle Pilots uniforms, Seattle Pilots had been stripped off the uniforms and someone had hastily sewn on um, Brewers. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. And again, like I said, we're talking about Major League Baseball. Yeah. Uh, you know, Seattle wasn't done, though, was it? I mean, somewhere along the line, baseball made an impression on the city. Tell us about the lawsuit that followed and how the Mariners actually came about. All right. Well, what, you know, Seattle did have a stadium, finally. They had, they had gone through the process of, of citing the stadium and then reciting the stadium and then having the Seattle Center um, not be the place. And finally, they decided to build the kingdom, well, where it was built, which was um, along the railroad tracks. Um, in the southern part, uh, the south part of the, the city. Well, they had a stadium, but they didn't have a team. They did have the Seahawks because the National Football League had come through, come through, but they didn't have a baseball team. And the state of Washington, along with King County and the city of Seattle, sued the American League. They were enjoined from, from suing uh, Pacific Northwest Sports because they were bankrupt, but they could sue the American League, and they did. Um, and it looked like they would probably win. Um, the, the trial was continued and continued and continued from 1970 until 1976, and there were all kinds of change of venues. Uh, but finally, the trial was heard in the county that is north of the county that Seattle is in. It was heard in Snohomish County, mm -hmm. and it went on for about three days, um, the, the attorneys for the American League said, listen, we'll win this eventually. The American League said, eventually is not good enough. We need a way out. And the way out was to make an, um, an out-of-court settlement, and the out-of-court settlement was the Seattle Mariners. Mm, interesting. And so the state, county, and city agreed, if you give us a new baseball team, which would end up being named the Mariners, we will not we will not continue this suit. We will not continue the action. And so the Seattle Mariners uh, became a team in 1976. And actually a pretty successful franchise. Sure, they haven't made the World Series, but they have had some great teams and some great players. You know, Bill, like you I know. said, when we started this episode of Sports Forgotten Heroes, we could probably spend the entire episode talking about six stadium and we have skipped so much about six stadium and getting it ready for opening day but in the end i have to believe it was the issues with six stadium more than anything else that spelled doom for the pilots was it not well i think that's a big piece i i finally come down to bill daly's unwillingness uh, to fund a franchise that was not in as desperate shape um, as 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 what maybe people said, and was probably in better shape than anywhere from six to ten other major league baseball teams. Hmm. Really, I think Bill Daly welching on his guarantee that he would he would put up eight million uh, to keep the pilots going. Um, that's the major one, but there's all kinds of different reasons. Uh, it's not a perfect storm. But it's quite a storm to get the pilots out of out of Seattle. <laughs> no doubt. You know, like we just said, the Mariners have had some fantastic seasons. So, although the last few haven't been exactly great, they are off to a good start this year. They but are, and last year was close. Yep. Yeah, yeah, 
Yep. And, uh, you know, in the early 2000s, they were they were terrific. Does yes. anyone ever talk about the pilots or is that team totally off the radar and filed away as forgotten? I, I tell people I wrote a book on the pilots um, and most of them look at me quizzically. Yeah. I mean, people who know baseball, they know the pilots. Absolutely. Uh, but just, you know, the casual fan uh, or, or my, my friends, um, the, the, the response is, Seattle had another baseball team, really? <laughs> so I'm not really sure how to address it, but calling it a debacle is certainly an understatement. <laughs> well, the, yes. Yeah, you know, from the battles with the politicians to the dirt haulers to inadequate restroom facilities, to threats from both sides, the American League, politicians, the team. How do we address the Seattle Pilots? Yep. How do we remember the Seattle Pilots? Well, we, we remember them as, as something that just didn't work. Um, you know, I, I, I say in the book, I, I kind of recall a cartoon by Thomas Nast, um, in the early 20th century, maybe late 19th century, about Boss Tweed, the corrupt boss of New York. And what he shows them, what he shows is guys in a circle pointing to the guy next to them, pointing to the guy next to him, next to him, next to him, next to him. The blame just goes around the circle, and I think that's the pilots. There's, there's blame enough to go all the way around the circle. The, the residents of Seattle, the politicians, the boosters... Um, the team, the owners, um, it's, it's just, it's a huge mess. What an interesting time. What, what, what an interesting franchise. A uh, couple weeks back, we did a show about the Kansas city scouts of the NHL who were only around for two years and their ownership problems were tremendous as well. And they ended up moving out to Colorado and finally settled in New Jersey. The pilots are very similar. Uh, it goes to show you how solid ownership has to be and, and the kind of work that has to go into, um, finding the proper place to play. I mean, the scouts, their, their, their arena wasn't ready when the season started, okay. uh, you know, so, so much in the way of financial difficulty, they never played before a full house. It's, uh -huh. it, it's such a similar story and it just goes to show you how much work has to go into, uh, all of, everything that needs to be done before a team ever moves into a city to ensure that it can sustain at least one or two or three years and build. And the pilots just didn't have that. I mean, between the they stadium. They just weren't ready. Yeah. This, and, and I did read someplace, I think you said 1970. I thought I saw even later, 71 or 72, was when they thought that Seattle at that point would be ready for a franchise. Yeah. And, and the irony is nobody would have come to the games because Seattle was in horrible economic shape, 70, 71. You might have heard the story, the billboard that was erected in 1971 that said, the last person out of Seattle turned off the light. Oh, man. That's... That's incredible. Bill, I want to thank you so much for joining me on Sports Forgotten Heroes. Anything else we should know about the Seattle Pilots? I can't think of anything. Uh, I, I've really enjoyed talking with you about the pilots. Um, I guess I have to say, for my own behalf, the book is still available. So yeah, tell us where. where tell, tell the listeners where they can well, get I it. Well, I think you can you can get it from the University of Washington Press, or if not there, probably even more cheaply from Amazon um, and or or even eBay. It's been around long enough that it's kind of circulated through. So there are plenty of places online. Uh, you know where where your listeners might might go for a book, and they'll find that book available. Are you writing anything else? Anything uh, for Saber? Any bio projects? Anything else you're working on? Uh, I I had I had done a uh, just a short thing for Saber uh, on the pilots, but um, I've I've sort of sort of decided I don't want to do do any more research. I'm doing some some volunteer work, and that's enough for me now. Awesome, Bill. Again, thank you so much for joining me on Sports Forgotten Heroes. It's been a lot of fun. Okay, I had fun too. Thanks for inviting me.
Awesome, thank you. As we had mentioned in the show, the Pilots finished their lone season in Seattle in last place of the newly formed American League West Division. They went 64-98. and 98. Their leading hitter was Tommy Davis, who batted 271, and he also led the team with 80 RBI. Don Mincher led the club with 25 home runs, and Tommy Harper swiped an astounding 73 bases, his highest total of his 15-year career. On the mound, the Pilots were led by, and I hope I get this right, Gene Brabender, who went 13-14 and 14 with an ERA of 4.36 and 139 strikeouts. Out of the pen, Diego Segui was 12-6, and six, and he led the team with 12 saves. Of course, some of the 12 wins he got came as a starter, as Segui actually pitched two complete games. In 1970, the Pilots moved to Milwaukee, where they went 65-97. and Harper led the Brew crew with a .296 batting average, but he saw his stolen base total drop to 38 although that still led the team. Harper also led the team in home runs with 31 and RBI with 82. Marty Patton led the Brewers in wins with 14. Overall, he was 14-12 and 12 with a 3.39 ERA, and Ken Sanders was the club's top reliever, going 5-2 with 13 saves. As for the city of Seattle, It wasn't long before the kingdom was built. Construction started shortly after the pilots left. It opened in 1976 for the Seattle Seahawks, who joined the NFL that year along with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The Mariners started playing in 1977, and like the pilots, they also went 64 and 98 in their first year. The kingdom which sat just over 59,000 for baseball, finally saw a winning team in 1991 when, after 14 straight years of sub-500 baseball, the Mariners went 83-79. and In 1995, Seattle saw its first postseason action when the Mariners won the AL West, but they lost in the playoffs to the Cleveland Indians, Four games to two. Seattle made the playoffs again in 1997, 2000, and 2001. They haven't made the playoffs since. As for the Brewers, the original Seattle team, they have met with more success recently, having made it to the NLCS in 2018, and they actually made it to the World Series in 1982, only to lose to the St. Louis Cardinals four games to two. And by the way, including 1969, it took this franchise 10 years to finish over 500 when, in 1978, they went 93-69 and 69 to finish third in the American League East. I'd like to thank Bill Mullins once again for joining us today. His book, Becoming Big League, Seattle, The Pilots, and Stadium Politics, is available on Amazon. It's really a good read and goes much more in depth than we did on today's show. Next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes, we welcome back Greg Wolf for a wonderful discussion on one of the first two players in baseball to hit at least 300 home runs and not be inducted into Baseball's Hall of Fame, Roy Seavers. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com 
slash sports history books. Pick up your copy today. Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.